Well, I want to, I want to read for you Romans 12, verses 1 to 5. It says this. It says, Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good, His pleasing, and His perfect will. For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment, in accordance with the faith that God has given to each of you. For just as each of you has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. You know, I have to tell you that I had a lot of fun last weekend at our kickoff barbecue. Wasn't that a good time? Did you have a good time last week? Absolutely. Yes, uh, it was. I had a lot of fun. I thought the burgers were so good this year. And uh, Dean and Dwayne, well, they deserve a lot of credit because, you know, they barbecued 700 burgers. I know, it's amazing. You know, but I, I do want to extend a thank you to um, my food servers, those who helped. Uh, in fact, everyone who volunteered uh, just to make that day so much fun. So thank you to all of our volunteers. That was wonderful. Uh, you know, I, I loved uh, the, the attitude that so many of you volunteers had just to say, yeah, I'm willing. I love that attitude. We had one person um, who's fairly new to us as a church who has never done face painting before, but who said, yeah, I'll give that a try and I'll help out. And I love that. Just this willingness to say, yes, I can help. I'm, I'm willing to help. I love that. And I love seeing all the kids' activities, the face painting and the bouncy castles and the Berry Buster Ball from Redberry. Uh, it was a lot of fun. And you know what I, I was really encouraged by, and I'm sure you noticed this too, we were with our community. We had so many people from the area, from the community, join us. And it just felt so good uh, to, to do that together, to enjoy space together. Uh, it was just a fun time. It was a fun, fun event. And, of course, the dunk tank. Oh, the dunk tank. Yeah, here's, here's innocent Millie Wright. Yeah. Uh, you know what, though? I mean... Wasn't, wasn't that fun, the, the excitement of, of throwing that ball and, you know, the tension of whether or not it was going to hit the target? Oh, that was fun. And we raised so much money for a good cause. You know, that was fun, wasn't it? Wasn't that the best? No, it was not the best. Stop what you're doing. No, you should be ashamed of yourselves. You have no idea how cold that water actually was. Like, you have no idea. Uh, you know, when it was my turn to get into the dunk tank, I seriously had to work myself up. If you were close to, while, like, to me while I was about to go in, I seriously I was like, okay, you can do this. And like, maybe I don't have to. No, you do have to, Jeff. Get in. Just get in the tank. And uh, I didn't want to because I had watched Andrew and I'd watched Amy and the agony that they'd, they went through with every single dunk into that icy water. And, and, I, and I said to Andrew after he was done, I said, so, like, like how bad was it? He, you know, Jeff, I lost a little bit of my soul every time I went into that water. <laughs> so that was quite encouraging. Um, and, and then, to make matters worse, there was Jen. Right before I got into that icy water, holding the hose, putting more cold freezing water into the tank to make sure I had the full experience. Yeah, what a loving wife I have. So thanks. Thanks, Jen, so much. Yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, things come back. I uh, just want to, just a heads up. Um, you know, but I, I seriously didn't want to get, get, get into that tank. I really didn't. But when I did get in, uh, I, I tried to be a good sport. I tried to have the best attitude possible. And uh, I do have to apologize uh, to Kelvin Friesen uh, because when Kelvin came to dunk me, I decided to make a cannonball splash as big as possible so I could get him a little wet as well. 
but it turns out I got him a lot of wet. And uh, so, Calvin, I'm so sorry. I, I please, publicly, will you forgive me? Good, thanks. Um, Kelvin's on our personnel team, so I want to keep my job. Uh, <laughs> so, sorry, Kelvin. But, but you know what? In all seriousness, I did have a lot of fun during our kickoff barbecue, and it was just a good event. And I, I would often look around the park and, and just notice that we were all together. And I remember thinking, this feels good. This feels like this is our community. This is our family. This is us. And I love that. Now, one of the things that we are uh, working through this as we begin this sort of fall series, I know we're still summer, it's, fall isn't technically here yet, we're hanging on to summer, but we're going into a series uh, that we're calling This Is Us, understanding what it means to be the church, what it means to have an identity as the church. And last week, Andrew did such a great job of giving us an overview of this topic, reminding us of our mission and our purpose of transform lives, transforming communities. That's what we are here about. That's what our aim is. And we believe that we will work towards that aim, that purpose, as we are committed to our gather, grow, and go process. And so that's what we want to discuss. What does that mean and what does that look like? You see, we gather together as transform lives to worship together and to dive into the word of God together. And we also grow together because we know that transformation is a process, right? It's a journey. We haven't arrived. We have not been completely transformed or completely changed into the shape that God has created for us, but it's a journey. And so we grow as transformed lives together in supportive small groups. And then we go we go to be a blessing and to see our communities transformed by the good news of Jesus Christ and with the love of God. So that's what, in a nutshell, Andrew shared with us last week. And as again, he did such a great job explaining those things. What we're going to do this morning is we're going to take a, a focus. We're going to focus on one specific area of that strategy, uh, and it's the area of grow, what it means to grow together? Why is it important for us to talk about growing together and how do we grow together? What does that look like? Well, as we look at what it means to grow, I want to show you what true growth looks like. This is General Sherman. He is he. It is a tree. Uh, it's a giant sequoia tree or a redwood tree that can be found in the giant Sequoia National Park in California. Now, General Sherman is an amazing, he's almost 300 feet tall, this tree, uh, just about 300 feet tall, and it has a diameter of 25 feet around. It is, it's a massive, massive tree. In fact, the redwood trees of this Northern California uh, forest. You can go to the next one already, Paul, if you don't mind. Um, these are the largest trees on earth. They're the biggest trees on earth, and, and they're amazing to, to witness. Now, it, it's, it's, it's amazing to think about how big they actually are because they can grow up to a weight of up to 500 tons. That's a million pounds. That's how big these trees can weigh. Now, it's a scale, their height, their width, their weight. It's a scale that's actually very hard to comprehend unless you witness these trees in person. And, and I know some of you have. So just out of curiosity, how many people here have been to the Redwood Forest in, in California? Yeah, they're, they're amazing, aren't they? And, and if you have witnessed them yourselves, you know just how impressive these trees are. It's amazing, actually, uh, how, how big they are that they've cut out a number of trees that you can actually drive a vehicle through. It, it's, it's phenomenal. And they are, uh, they're massive. But what's amazing is that they start out as a small seed, no bigger than the, a, a tomato seed. And they result in this amazing growth of a tree that could be as high as 35 stories tall. Now that is growth. And in fairness, of course, it's taken a long time for these massive trees to grow that large. But when we take a look at how they grow, 
we'll find that, they, that these trees hold a few secrets that we can learn from as well. First of all, their root system. Their root system is, is amazing. Uh, you know, it would be easy to assume that for trees that to be this tall, obviously they've got deep roots so that they can stay stable and they can stay upright. But that's just not the case. Uh, redwoods actually have very shallow roots, only going about five feet deep or so, which is absurd to think of a tree that's, you know, 275 feet tall, only having five feet uh, deep of roots. But what they lack in depth, they make up for in width, because these roots can actually go out from the tree up to about 100 feet away from the tree itself. Now, because the roots of this tree do spread out, it does give the tree some stability to, to withstand uh, wind and things like that. But its true strength comes in how their roots interact with other redwoods. You see, redwood trees have very shallow roots that spread out, but they also intertwine and connect with the roots of other trees. And that's their true source of stability to these ginormous trees. It's how their roots support each other. You see, they thrive in these thick groves where their roots can intertwine and actually even fuse together with other roots. And it gives these trees just tremendous support from the forces of nature as they literally hang on to each other. It's this amazing picture, the way that we, they can withstand uh, wind and also uh, even floods, they can withstand it because they hang on to each other. You see, the redwood trees, they never survive alone, ever. They form what is considered with these trees, they, they form tribes and they form communities. Sometimes they grow so close to each other that they actually merge, many, multiple trees merge into one tree at the base. It's amazing. The redwoods have this incredible way of supporting each other and sustaining massive growth as they work together as a team. They share nutrients, they share resources, and they provide strength for each other. And that's the key to their survival and their growth, interdependence. And this is a perfect picture. It's a perfect image for how we grow together in small groups. You see, like the redwoods, we can't survive alone. Now, of course, people do need alone time. Uh, people do need their own time for sure and for themselves, no doubt about that. But it's clear that we have a great need for relationships, for friendships, to connect with people around us, our neighbors, and to have groups of like-minded people in our lives. You see, we need people to help us think past what we can comprehend on our own. I need people in my life to make sense of even what Scripture is saying, what God is doing in my life. We need people to help solve life's problems. We need people to provide strength in our time of needs, and we need need people to be able to support us so that we can survive and thrive just like these redwoods do, interconnected. It provides our health, both individually and collectively. Because when we withdraw our roots, when we withdraw them and keep them to ourselves as mine or they're, they're, they're my roots, I actually think that we make a huge mistake. You see, when we withdraw ourselves and when we distance ourselves from others, we actually hinder our growth. It doesn't make us stronger to be on our own. It actually makes us weaker because we hinder and we limit how other people can help us, nurture us, and help us to grow. And this is actually the model of the church. We see this in, in Ephesians 4, uh, verses 11 to 17, where it says this. It says, so Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and the teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up, so that it can grow, until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature. We're growing into maturity, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then we'll, be, we'll no longer be infants tossed back and forth by waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. Instead, 
speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. From him, the whole body is joined and held together by every supporting ligament, and it grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. You see, as the church, we are meant to live in unity and to mature and to grow, and we grow in connection. Being connected first to the head of the church, which is Jesus, and connected to one another. You see, the body, the church, it grows and it builds itself up in love as it's held together by every supporting ligament, every part, every person. And we're called to be active, to do our part. We're not called to be disconnected and to live separate lives. We are called to be like the roots of these ginormous redwood trees, being held together, sharing our resources, supporting each other, caring for each other. And this is what our life groups are all about. This is what our huddles are all about. This is what our seniors group is all about. This is what our key women are all about, being connected in community. Our growth and our health depend on how we are interconnected to other believers in small groups. Because without this amazing root system, these redwood trees wouldn't survive. They would simply be pushed over by strong winds and raging floods. And don't you find that more and more we are being pushed around? That we are sometimes even being pushed over by the strong winds in this life? That we can so easily be overwhelmed by the storms of life? But when we have the support of others, it gives us a chance. It gives us the ability to make it through, to lean on each other and to survive. Because another amazing aspect of these huge redwood trees is how they sustain or are sustained through other elements such as fire. Redwood trees are actually very fire resistant. And there's a number of reasons why. First of all, the trees themselves, as you can see by General Sherman here, have very thick trunks. The wood is very thick, making it hard for fire to actually penetrate uh, the wood itself. Not only that, but the wood contains a high volume of water. That's what makes it so heavy, so dense. And so obviously, even that protection against fire, it's hard uh, for fire to catch onto the wood because it's very wet. It's very dense with water. In fact, the, the tree's sap is mostly just water. So it's got these defense mechanisms built into it. Also, what's very interesting is that uh, redwood trees, uh, sequoia trees, lack something called resin, which is often found in very flammable trees like spruce trees and fir trees and, and pine trees. So when there are times in which other trees and shrubs are, are cleared out uh, by forest fires, redwoods are often left standing and they're left to grow on for, for centuries. You see, our small groups function the same way as we create supportive groups that act like a thick layer of protection for those storms in our life. And also, we pour into each other with what is good. You see, redwood trees are full of water, making them resistant to fire. But as small groups, as people who invest in each other, support each other, pray for each other, study the word of God together, we invest into one another what is good. And we share that living water of Jesus. And we share that into our lives, our homes, our families, and into our relationships. Because the truth is, we're influenced by the people around us. We are. We're influenced by our friends around us. We're influenced by our coworkers, our family members. And I want to ask you, who's investing in you? What influence is pouring into your life? Is it what is good? And another question is, are you investing and pouring into the lives of other people for their growth and benefit? Ephesians 4, 1 to 6 says this. It says, I urge you to live a wor life worthy of the calling you have received. So be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. And make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, 
one God and Father who is over all and through all and in all. So let's pour into each other. Let's invest in each other and support each other in love. Being in a small group gives us that support and it helps us to withstand the harsh elements of this life because there is pressure. There are storms that we face and we've got other people to support us. We can deal with those storms. Now, best of all, when we look at these amazing trees, we see that they are amazing in their design. You see, these factors of how they grow, how their roots are, are interconnected, how they, are, how they stand up to wind, to fire, to floods, how they do all those things are, are, are because of a result of how they've been created and designed by God. These amazing trees are works of God. It's hard not to be in that forest or even see a picture like that and see the amazing hand of God's creation. You know, this past Wednesday, uh, this week, um, when it kind of stopped raining for a few minutes, uh, my, my kids and I went and played out in the backyard before supper. And while we were playing in that backyard, we noticed a huge uh, flock of geese flying overhead. And it was a little bit discouraging because, you know, maybe they're already leaving and they're seeing the weather to come. Uh, but as we noticed this flock, I, I told my kids to look up. And first I told them to make sure their mouths were closed because they're flying over us and it's just good advice but then but but then I asked I said hey do you guys notice how they're flying and Brody said yeah they're flying like an arrow they're flying in the shape of a V and then I talked to my kids about how these birds didn't just figure this out by accident they didn't just do this um, because of just one of the birds said, hey guess what I got this great idea let's try this no they were created this way they were designed to fly this way. Birds fly in the shape of a V with purpose. It's, it's this amazing model that they fly in, this, this formation, to conserve energy for a long flight and for a long migration. And it's amazing. What I love about it is that if you ever watch them and watch the way that they, they flap their wings, I just realized I look kind of silly doing this, but that's all right. If you watch them flapping their wings, it's not completely in unison, but it's in rhythm. And you watch how they flap it's like flap, flap, flap. They kind of go in rhythm. And why they do that is because they pass the benefit on to the birds behind them to be able for them to, to use this, this streamline, this, this air that is a little bit easier to fly through. It's this unbelievable uh, way that God has designed them. Now, of course, a pushback would be, well, this has come from evolution. But even in evolution, there is design, which points to a designer. God has created and designed these birds to fly this way. And as they support one another, just like the roots of these redwoods, we see God's amazing plan for creation, to live in unity and to live in harmony. And this is true for us as well, isn't it? God has designed us to live in relationships. It's in our DNA. When God created us, he created us in his image. And God is a relational being, and as such, we are as well. We're meant to be relational. Even if you think about our, our traits, our emotional being, our mental being, our physical traits, they all point to being created to be in a relationship. Even the ability to speak is to relate to others. It's who we've been created to be. In Genesis 2.18, God said, It's not good for man to be alone, so I will make a suitable helper for him. And you know, it's not good to be alone. In fact, do you know that isolation is used as a form of torture, as a form of punishment? Isolation can be used to break down a person's will, to, to break down their strength, and to seriously just to break a person in general. It is a torture. And it's also our penalty for sin. Our sin has separated us from God, and it has alienated us from one another. But the good news is that Jesus, through his death and resurrection, has conquered sin, has conquered death, and what it's done is it's given us the ability to be saved back into restoration of those relationships. We're restored back to communion with God and back to community with each other. Now, of course, we do live in a broken world with the effects of sin and selfishness all around us. 
and these factors do attempt to pull us away from God. You see, sin has, has like this gravitational pull away from God. But when we are in small groups, when we have support of people in our lives, it helps to keep us grounded, keep us focused on being transformed, on our growth, and on Jesus. Life is not easier alone. We think we don't need people, but we do. We need each other, and we long for relationships. It's actually what brought you here this morning, being in community. It's who we are, it's who we were made to be, and it's the design of the church. I love in Acts 2, 42 to 47, it talks about the first church of believers, right after Pentecost and what, what the church looked like. It said that they were devoted to teaching. They were devoted to prayer. They were devoted to gathering together, to the breaking of bread. And they did this in the temple courts, collectively as a group, but also from house to house in small pockets of community. Because that's where discipleship happens, in relationship with others. You know what's interesting is that I've heard uh, a lot recently that there are people who are just saying, you know, I want to take a break from life groups. And I just want to step away for this season and, and not be in a life group or not be connected to key women. And I just don't understand it. Because being connected to each other isn't just a good idea. It's who we are. It's how we've been created. It's the design that God has put into our life. This is us. So where do we go from here? Well, first of all, I would like you to take out your bulletin, and I'd like you all to be encouraged to to take the next steps that are listed on the back of the bulletin. First of all, I want to really encourage you to to come next Sunday and meet here in the sanctuary with me at 11 a.m. and for what we're going to be doing, uh, what we are calling doing discipleship together. It's essentially a a, a strategy of vision casting and it's a training session for what we are wanting our life groups, our huddles, our, our discipleship and small group ministry to look like and how you can be involved in that. And this is for everybody. You're going to want to be there, so be encouraged. If you're not volunteering next Sunday somewhere, come back, and I would love to share with you and train you a little bit of how these groups are going to look over this next coming year. Answer some questions as well. It would be a great conversation to be a part of. And I want to encourage you to come on the 29th for our workshop that we're hosting called Saturate with Ben Connolly. 6 p.m., September 29th. It's a free workshop, and it'll be one that you're not going to want to miss. There have been people who've said, I don't know what Saturate means. What does that mean? Essentially, its tagline is being a disciple of Jesus in the everyday stuff of life. You see, there's more to being a Christian than just coming to church every Sunday, right? There's more. And what this this seminar is going to be about, this workshop, is going to, it's going to be a biblical view of what it means to be a disciple of Jesus in all the areas of life. To saturate our lives with being a follower of Jesus. And how do we join in with what God is already doing on the mission he's a part of? How can we join him in, uh, in what he's already doing in our lives, in and around and through us? And it's essentially the definition of what it means to be transformed lives, being a disciple, joining God in his mission to see our communities transformed as well. So come. It's a free workshop. It's a free seminar, 6 p.m. on the 29th. And also, if you are not in a group currently, I just want to let you know that I do have a number of life groups right now who are willing and ready to add more people into their groups. So if you're not a part of a group, there is some spots right now that we could get you plugged in. But if we don't find a a, a spot or a group for you right away, I am going to be starting again something that I like to call not in a group group. And really what that is, is that is for people who aren't connected already, um, we're going to start meeting on Sunday mornings during the Sunday school hour, and we're going to be meeting kind of, there's a balcony room on, in the balcony up there, uh, and I know there's maybe some mobility challenges there, and I apologize, it's kind of the best room for us to use, but we're going to start a life group together if you're not involved. We're going to meet Sunday morning starting on September 29th and essentially start a group together. So if you'd like to come join us, it's for anybody, and if you're not a part of a group, we want to encourage you to be a part of that. Take those next steps and also fill out the bottom part of that, uh, that bulletin where it talks about where you're connected or where you could be connected. If you're already connected to a life group or key women or seniors or a huddle or missional community, still fill it out. 
Fill it out as a way to have your commitment to being a part of that community. Fill it out, put your name, yes, either I'm a leader or, or this is the group that I'm a part of. Fill it out. If you're willing to lead, we always have a need for leadership within our small groups. And if God is nudging you saying, Clint, you can lead. Uh, maybe, maybe, maybe you can, Clint. Um, but just respond to that nudge. And don't worry, if you're willing to be a leader, you're not going to have to lead alone. I'm going to be there to help you to start a group together and to put supportive people around you. And if you're not a part of a group at all, indicate that, that you're willing and wanting to be a part of a small group of people who want to support you, encourage you, pray for you, and push each other towards Jesus. And I'd love to get you connected. So fill that out, tear it off, and put it in the praise thing. What did we call it? Our praise bucket we got to have a better name. We'll figure out a better name for that. Uh, but put it in the praise bucket for now, just in the foyer. When you go out, you'll see where that is. Fill it out. Put it in there. And I want to be able to help you take that next step to being in community with one another. This is us. This is our design. It's who we've been created to be. It's who the church is. Not created and not designed to live segregated lives, but to live lives together to grow together as we follow Jesus together. Hebrews 10, verses 19 25 reads this. It says, And so, dear brothers and sisters, we can boldly enter into heaven's most holy place because of the blood of Jesus. By his death, Jesus opened a new and life-giving way through the curtain into the most holy place. And since we have a great high priest who rules over God's house, let us go right into the presence of God with sincere hearts, fully trusting him. For our guilty conscience have been sprinkled with Christ's blood to make us clean, and our bodies have been washed with pure water. So let us hold tightly without wavering to the hope we affirm, for God can be trusted to keep his promise. And let us think of ways that we can motivate one another together to acts of love and good works. And let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but let's encourage each other all the more as we see his day approaching. Let's pray. God, I want to thank you again for an opportunity to gather together as your church, as the church to worship you. God, you are worthy of our praise. And as we opened this morning to say that it's our our true and proper worship to live lives in sacrifice to you, Father, that is our goal, not to have our own perception of who you've called us to be or how you've called us to live, but, Father, to see how you've designed us, how you've created us, and how you've purposed us to be. So, Father, thank you for that. Thank you for creating us as relational beings to support each other. And so, Father, I just pray that we will begin to see more and more that it may cost giving up some things that we enjoy doing on our own, but the reward and the joy of spurring one another on towards love and good deeds in you, Father, is such a rich blessing. This is us, but it's who you've created us to be. So we worship you and we say thank you. As we close our service here, may you be glorified and praised in this song, in our words, and as we begin to, if we have Sunday, as we have Sunday school today and with our congregational meeting, all of these things going on, Father. Our parents' meeting, may you be blessed by how we submit to you and how we commit to each other, all for your glory's sake. Amen.